Okay, so we're going to talk about this thing called protein conformation. And protein conformation is this description of the final structure of a protein. And really it's a description of the structure of the protein. The protein's conformation is going to be its final structure. But there are four levels of structure, or four descriptions of structure that you need to be aware of. We name each of these structures based off of a, a sequential order, from <coughs> primary to secondary to tertiary to quaternary. So one, two, three, four. When we talk about the protein's primary structure, we are referencing its amino acid sequence. So you can see the primary structure of this particular protein is right here. And it starts out with aspartic acid, glycine, phenylalanine, glutamic acid, and so on and so forth. So each individual amino acid in the correct sequence from the beginning all the way to the end is its primary sequence. And all the primary sequence tells us is the information that's held. What are the amino acids that are present? really doesn't tell us anything about the function. It may indicate some things about the overall structure that are possible because of the presence of certain uh, amino acids in the sequence. They only can bind up in certain ways, right? So this is the primary sequence. And really, the primary sequence just simply holds the information to build the specific structure. Now that amino acid structure, and I know it looks like, okay, there's a primary structure and then another part of the protein is in a secondary structure, and that's not the case. This primary structure is the amino acid sequence, and we can read an amino acid sequence from the beginning of the protein all the way to the very last end amino acid. All of those amino acids are going to begin to be structured into these internal structures. So if you look at a protein, its overall structure here, you'll see that there's this small little length in the middle of the protein, in the middle of the amino acid sequence, that forms sort of this helical structure. Okay? That's going to be a secondary structure or a secondary protein conformation. So primary is just simply the amino acid sequence. The secondary is dealing with the internal structures that are present. So our internal three-dimensional structures. And most of these three-dimensional structures are going to be attributed to and held together by things like hydrogen bonds that we've already discussed previously. So as you're looking at this particular <coughs> ribbon diagram of this protein, whatever this protein is, probably hemoglobin, not the hemoglobin. You can see that we have this kind of green coiled structure, and then we have this other red structure where it kind of looks like everything's all kind of parallel together. So the amino acids, as we run through that sequence, these are held together in sort of a sheet-like structure. Here's another helix, and then we have all of these kind of connecting loops and things like that. Each of those is a three-dimensional structure, and it's an internal structure, so each of these on their own would be classified as the secondary structures of the protein. The alpha helix is this particular structure. And we're going to see alpha helices in a variety of different proteins. Okay? The amino acids in sequence wind up to form this helical structure. So if I were to give you a picture on an exam that looked like this and say identify the secondary structures by name, you would point, okay, well, here's one of them, draw an arrow to this first one, 
that's an alpha helix. And then I have another alpha helix over here. And then right here in the middle, where basically the amino acids are kind of strung together like this, they form a sheet-like structure. And those can be called pleated, pleated sheet sheets. Sometimes are referred to as beta sheets. So you can just put in the Greek letter beta there and call it a beta sheet. So you might draw an arrow in right here and say this is a pleated sheet. So these are just going to be ribbons that are lined together or run parallel to each other to form that <coughs> sheet-like structure. And then we have these loops, which are basically the connections between the other three-dimensional secondary structures. So the loops are just going to be that connecting factor. Now collectively, this whole thing here, this whole structure, considering not the individual secondary structures, but the protein as a whole, is going to be called the tertiary structure. So the three-dimensional shape of the whole peptide. So really what you can see is that there are two alpha helices that flank a beta pleated sheet, sheet all linked together to form this three-dimensional structure of this particular protein, its whole structure. Now it's probably most proper to call this a peptide uh, because remember that the final protein may have multiple peptides that get incorporated, which is what you can see down here. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So this could just be part of a protein. It could be an individual peptide, which is a unit of an overall protein. But there are some cases where the protein is just a single peptide, and so it's okay to call that a protein or a peptide when that's basically the final structure when it's not going to be organized into this final and last uh, confirmation, which is the tertiary structure. Before we move there, though, the tertiary structure, we basically have to hold the alpha helices in the right place and set up the beta sheet and keep everything organized well. Uh, again, uh, this is going to be due to some of the reactions that we've already talked about. <coughs> if the region of the protein uh, or the amino, or there's a, a length of amino acids that are really hydrophobic, they don't interact well with water, that hydrophobic interaction is going to cause those parts of the amino acids to pull inward away from the water to be protected. So the hydrophobic chains, hydrophobic regions. And chains fold away from the water. So typically they're going to be inward, unless they're incorporated in the cell membrane, then they can be uh, uh, outward in interacting with the hydrophobic tails of the membrane. In addition to hydrophobic regions and the side chains um, being away from the water, helping to organize that molecule, we also may reinforce the overall structure by these van der Waals 
interactions that we've mentioned previously. You all should be familiar with an amino acid called cysteine. You would happen to remember what makes cysteine pretty unique compared to other amino acids. Sulfur is present in the side chain of cysteine. And whenever you have sulfur and sulfur between two cysteines, they can form a covalent linkage called a disulfide bridge. And so on two different parts of the molecule, if I have a cysteine here, and then I don't see another cysteine, so let's just say that this one is a cysteine, I may be able to pull these together to form a disulfide bridge, and I fit kind of <coughs> this loop or this hairpin-like structure. So that disulfide bridge is possible when there are two cysteine uh, sulfur containing side chains that are allowed to interact. You get that sulfur molecules linked up together and can help create structure. Okay, so I already said that occasionally we'll have one peptide to equal a protein, but a lot of our proteins are actually made up of multiple peptides. When we organize, such as a hemoglobin, when we put hemoglobin together, we have four individual peptides. Two of them are the alpha chain, two of them are the beta chain, and they come together and they organize the peptides relative to each other in a very specific way, and that's called a quaternary structure. So this is the combination of two or more folded proteins, I'm sorry, folded peptides, I should say, to make up the whole peptide itself. So if you were just to look at a single peptide here, what would be, what would be the, the structural level here? Of just that single peptide. It's in its Over my neighbor's dog today. You guys aren't even paying attention. <coughs> what is this individual? What's the structure here? Is it primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary for this individual peptide? That individual peptide is in its tertiary structure. Now I associate it with other peptides and it's in its quaternary structure. Inside of there, this may be an alpha helis right here. There's also going to be an individual amino acid sequence, right? Those are each the different conformations or structural designators for proteins. For a protein to work well, if it's a multi-peptide protein, what do I need to get it into? Primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure? Okay, for a protein to work, what, what structure does it need to be? Do I need to just know the amino acid sequence? Or do I have to fold it up and put it into a tertiary structure? I have to fold it up and put it into a tertiary structure. And I have to get it into the right tertiary or right quaternary structure or tertiary structure to work depending on how many peptides it has. And if I don't, it doesn't work as well, right? Because if I begin to change the shape of the protein, what do I do to biology? I change the function of the biology. <coughs> Now there are actually some ways to change the function, or to change the structure out of there, to change the function. <laughs> the term denaturation basically means to take out of the natural form. Whenever you denature something, you're causing it to lose its shape. And if I lose my shape, invariably, what do I do? If I lose my shape, I lose what? I lose my function. So hemoglobin, anyone know what the function of hemoglobin is? 
Yes, it transports oxygen, it also transports carbon dioxide. It transports oxygen from the lungs to the working for these tissue in mammals. It transports oxygen from, I'm sorry, carbon dioxide from the working tissues to the lungs to the expired back out in mammals. I cannot carry oxygen at the same time in, as carbon dioxide and vice versa. Okay? So I want the hemoglobin to be really, really good at picking up oxygen where? In the lungs. And then as I move it towards the tissue, I want to change its function, right? I want to go from carrying oxygen to delivering oxygen. <coughs> the way I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to create a situation where I have a slightly higher pH in my tissue. pH is one of the things that can cause proteins to denature. If I denature it by increasing pH just a little bit, that acidity, I'm sorry, I actually decrease pH, right? Because I'm becoming more acidic. Decrease, decrease pH just a little bit. It causes the shape of the molecule to be altered just a tiny bit, and the hemoglobin releases the oxygen. In the process of changing a little bit where preferentially releases oxygen, it actually increases the efficiency to bind carbon dioxide. So right in the tissue, tissue beds are a little bit more acidic, a little lower pH, that oxygen releases, carbon dioxide gets picked up, and the pH of the blood is reversed during respiration. And so as you expire, you increase the um, pH, decreasing acidity, and that pH, uh, increasing pH causes another conformational switch for denaturation of the protein where the oxygen releases and carbon dioxide, oxygen binds and carbon dioxide releases. So that's what actually made it, maybe what it would look like if we had a functional protein and then a severely denatured protein. Obviously, I could cause a minor amount of denaturation where the protein may adjust <coughs> in certain regards. I may lose an alpha helicy or one of my links may shift down a little bit, changing the overall function of that particular protein. And again, we've already kind of mentioned that pH does this really well. So changing the pH is going to change the efficiency of the protein. And I mean, we're talking about everything. We're not just talking about hemoglobin and oxygen and carbon dioxide. We're talking about enzymes. Change the pH of an enzyme a little bit, or around an enzyme, that enzyme is going to change its function. Temperature does it as well. How many of you feel really good when you have a fever? You feel awful when you have a fever, right? And that's why we have some drugs that help try to manage the fever. When you increase temperature, which is what a fever is, your proteins begin to denature a little bit. And so they don't function as well. And they don't allow you to feel as you normally should feel. One area of proteins um, that are really important are these things called pro uh, chaperone proteins. Chaperone proteins will help new, what we would call nascent, N-A-S-C-E-N-T, new proteins to hold <coughs> it up into the right final conformation. Now, not all proteins need to be chaperoned into the right conformation, but occasionally proteins will have to. And so as the protein is being generated by the ribosome, there are chaperone proteins that will bind up onto that protein as it forms, and they protect certain regions of the protein, or will protect the whole protein. These are older proteins. This is the new protein, and so that's why we call it a chaperone, right? You go to a field trip in elementary school, you take a chaperone along, which is usually one of your parents who's older, and it keeps you in line, but you get out of line, right? So if you fall out of structure, you can think about it. The chaperones here are the older proteins that are helping that new protein to go through that maturation process to the final folded state that would be required. Okay, so that's going to be a chap chaperone protein. It's a group of proteins that support new proteins in their folding process to get into that final conformational form. By the way, just stepping back real quick, single peptide chain, right? So this is maybe a protein that's a single 
a single peptide for the whole protein. What would this be? And what is this here? Okay, and what type of structure? Secondary structure, and what about this? Pleated sheet, and that's also an example of secondary structure. Overall, what would we call the structure here? Tertiary. Okay. <coughs> All right. As a class of molecules, proteins have several different functions. With several different functions. Some of them are shown in this figure here. And I'm going to give you a few others. But basically, proteins, my, my mantra as a physiologist is that proteins confer physiology. Everything that's happening right now in you and around you, what you're responding to, is because of proteins and the way the proteins are functioning. So this class of macromolecules called proteins, their functions are really diverse. They can act as structural components in the cell. And so they may support the cell. Collagen is an example of a structural protein that helps support cellular structure and tissue structure. They could also <coughs> act in storage. And so there are going to be some proteins that get put together and they just simply exist to contain amino acids. And we call that the amino acid pool. And your cell is going to have these proteins present that are storing amino acids in the amino acid pool. Uh, one example here is a protein we find in milk called casein. Casein is actually just simply a storage of amino acids. They're also going to aid in transport. Transport meaning to move material around the cell. The hemoglobin is a transport molecule. It moves oxygen around the organism. We may also break that up into what are called channels. I'll just put that on there. Channels are going to be molecules that are found inside of the membrane that allow molecules such as sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium to be moved across the membrane, to move from one liquid, the intracellular fluid or extracellular fluid, to the other. Yeah. Okay, so channels are molecules found inside the membrane that... They're proteins that are going to be typically associated, um, well, typically associated with the membrane, but that's not the only type of transport protein that we have. This type of transport protein is called a channel, and it just allows stuff to cross the membrane. We also have transport proteins like hemoglobin, which circulate in the red blood cell within the bloodstream to move oxygen from one location to another, <coughs> carbon dioxide as well. There's a whole group of protein, proteins that act as hormones. And so these are signaling molecules that help to coordinate activity of the organism. So insulin is an example of a protein that acts as a hormone that helps to regulate the blood glucose levels. So it helps to move the glucose supply into places like the liver and the skeletal muscle where it can be either stored or utilized. Proteins can also be receptors. Receptors are going to bind something. In, in the world of receptor proteins, what they bind is typically going to be referred to as the line. So we have molecules that are going to be called ligands, and those ligands will bind to certain proteins. And they don't necessarily have to be bound up in the membrane. They can be in the cytosol as well. That receptor basically binds that ligand that holds information. The ligand is produced because it's responding to some sort of stimuli. And so the receptor binds the ligand and it responds to the signals. So insulin, 
which is one of our hormone proteins. Insulin is released in response to high levels of glucose in the blood. It will bind to another protein, so we have a protein-protein interaction called the insulin receptor. The insulin receptor causes another protein to translocate locate to the cell membrane called GLUT4, glucose transporter 4. This will kind of protein that is, the transport protein. And it's going to effectively move glucose out of the extracellular fluid in the blood into places like the liver, the cells of the liver and the cells of the skeleton. We also have proteins involved in uh, that are called contractile proteins that are involved in movement. Myosin and actin, you're going to find in the skeletal muscle. And they are primarily responsible for what we would call muscle contraction. You're also going to find that during uh, cell division at the uh, end of mitosis, the last phase is called telophase. We're going to talk about that a little bit this semester. You have the cell that needs to be pinched off, right? You need to take the cellular contents and divide the two cells into two new daughter cells. The cell, as it's pinched off, it looks kind of like someone's pulling a, a string on a stuff sack or a sleeping bag. It's motor proteins that facilitate that process. That they're contractile motor proteins. We're also going to have proteins that are involved in defense. These are going to be proteins that um, protect or provide protection from disease. Protection's not full spell, right? So protection from disease. On the surface of your skin right now, you have antimicrobial proteins. If you come in contact with <laughs> which you're gonna today, many, many different times, those antimicrobial proteins will actually be able to attack and defend against that microbial invasion, break apart the cell membrane, or do something else to destroy the invading organism. Proteins can also be this class known as enzymes. And enzymes are going to be proteins that catalyze reactions. You have hundreds of thousands of reactions that need to occur every day inside of the cell to maintain life. And you are going to learn, and maybe you already remember from either chemistry or from previous biology classes, that chemical reactions really don't happen all that well, most chemical reactions all that well, at room temperature, right? So gasoline, if I put it on the table, it's not really going to combust. But if I take that gasoline in the presence of oxygen and I give it a little bit of a spark, add some heat, it becomes a spontaneous very aggressive reaction, okay? So I can add heat to a reaction to make that reaction go. That's not great in terms of human and the movement physiology and biology in general because heating things up causes other proteins that are required for survival to not function as well. So we have these enzymes, and it's usually one enzyme <coughs> for one specific reaction that reduces the activation required, the energy required to activate that reaction. So if I had an enzyme that could catalyze the reaction between oxygen and gasoline, I could just throw that enzyme into a bucket of gasoline and it would cause the whole thing to go at room temperature. So we use enzymes to reduce activation of energy to get around the fact that we can't just simply globally increase temperature. Anyone have any information or any questions rather on protein before I move on to our fourth and final mass molecule? 
acids. So our nucleic acids are our information molecules. The nucleic acids, we're going to have two. We're going to have DNA and we're going to have RNA. The information that's held in DNA is converted to a message, the messenger RNA, and that message is what holds the information for producing proteins. So in other words, nucleic acids are going to be used to code the primary amino acid sequence of proteins. And then it's that primary amino acid sequence that's used to generate our secondary structures and our tertiary structure, and it required our primary structure. Again, two types that you need to be familiar with, DNA and RNA. And these are, again, going to be polymers. We're going to have an individual monomer, a building block, and we're going to have the polymer, which is the much larger molecule all the monomers put together. You're probably vaguely familiar with some of these images. RNA and DNA, very, very similar. Uh, there's really just a couple differences. One of the big differences is the presence of uh, uracil instead of thiamine. Uracil is found in RNA, thiamine is found in DNA. We've already talked about that. DNA typically <laughs> comes with two strands uh, formed into this double helix, whereas RNA is typically in a single strand that will form internal foldings and things like that in pyramid structures. So this may fold back on itself, and it may look like a double-stranded molecule internally, but when you step back and look at the whole thing, it's just sections of it folded back on itself. Inside of the cell, and in fact, really, all of life requires information flow. We need to be able to respond to our surroundings so that we can turn on the right genes to produce the correct proteins to adequately respond to changes in our internal and our external environment. The information flow is modeled into what's known as the central dogma of molecular biology. And we go from DNA to RNA to protein. We're going to fill this in as we move on towards some of the more molecular biology type things in this class. But each of the arrows also has a name. And in fact, there's even ways to sort of add some arrows. So those arrows, one of them would be the DNA can be replicated. DNA can be transcribed or reverse transcribed, and then proteins can be translated. Okay, so that's the basic information flow. DNA holds the information and maintains it. RNA is what's used to read the information. Protein is what is what's used to function in the cell. So let's start out with a little bit of structure for our nucleic acids. So I've already told you um, that just like proteins and carbohydrates, but not lipids, we're going to use the polymer monomer designations. The nucleotides are going to be the monomers. And the nucleotides are really the nitrogenous containing base associated with a phosphate and then a sugar. In the case of <coughs> DNA, it's deoxyribose. In the case of RNA, the sugar is just simply ribose. <coughs> so the nucleotide is the monomer, and we build the polymer from those nucleotides. We would call it a polynucleotide. So you are all most familiar, probably, with the polynucleotide version of nucleic acids. Uh, 
right, so the nucleotide, this is the monomer. And nucleotides are made up of three different parts or three different units. So here you can see the three different units and how they're all kind of put together. The three units, just to kind of label them out first, are going to be phosphate and pentose. What, what kind of molecule is a pentose? I think I heard it. It's a sugar. Yep, it's a saccharide because of the OSE. And then the last part is this thing called an nitrogenous containing base or an nitrogenous base. Nitrogen containing base or nitrogenous base. So the phosphate is just this group right here, right? And really we can put three of them together or two of them together or just one. And we can attach it to a pentose. How many carbons in a pentose? Five carbons. And those five carbons are going to either be, one of them is either going to be oxygenated or it's going to not be oxygenated. When it's oxygenated, it's a ribose. When it's not, it's a deoxy ribose. So we're going to have to have the phosphate and the pentose, and then one of these nitrogen containing bases, one of our nitrogenous bases. For DNA, it's adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. For RNA, it's adenine, guanine, uracil, and cytosine. So the sugar, DNA, again deoxyribose, RNA, just simply ribose. So the phosphate group looks the same, and within the DNA and RNA molecules, it's just a single phosphate that is going to be bridged to the next rung on the ladder, which will be another phosphate. So we have kind of that interaction between um, sharing this oxygen's double bond across this negatively charged oxygen, we, we can create, um, we create the chain. And then we'll have our DNA, the oxyribose, RNA, our ribose, and then we'll put on the base. And we'll covalently attach the base. And there are two different types of bases. And those two different types of bases are pyrimidine and the pyrimidines just have a single nitrogen carbon ring. So our pyrimidines are going to be adenine, thymine, and I'm sorry, cytosine, thymine, and uracil because they just have the single ring. And then we have the purines. And those are going to be two rings, adenine and guanine. Had a question on the last exam, trying to identify what type of molecule is present. And I gave you the sequence of both of them, or the nucleotides that were present, and many of you got the answer correct that uracil is going to be my RNA contained. RNA is going to be, uracil is going to be contained with RNA. So if we find uracil, we know that we have an RNA sample. Alright, so <coughs> let's talk about building the polymer. We are going to bond our nucleotides together. When we bond our nucleotides together, we are putting together a phospho diester linkage, phosphodiester linkage. <coughs> Notice it's an enzymatically catalyzed reaction. We have a ligase. 
DNA ligase, RNA ligase, that ligase is going to be the enzyme that allows our molecules to be put together through this thing called the phosphodiester linkage. <coughs> Using the phosphate group, remember we have those open oxygens, we are going to strap together that phosphate group to the carbon group. And so we call it a sugar phosphate backbone. So the phosphate group attached to the sugar to form the sugar phosphate backbone. This is going to be the very outside, and then the bases will extend in towards the middle of the molecule. Now, the sugar phosphate backbone is going to look identical all the way up, right? What's going to differ is going to be the bases and what nitrogenous base is attached, attached to each rung of the ladder. So the nucleotides vary by their nitrogenous base, the nitrogen containing base that's present. The polynucleotide known as DNA, you all are probably familiar that it has a unique structure. What is the structure called? The double helix. The double helix of DNA is going to be formed through two nucleotide strands. So we really have two individual polynucleotides. And those two individual polynucleotides, those big long strands of DNA, they are going to be adhered together in complement. Meaning that G's and C's go together and A's and T's go together across the molecule between the two strands. Those two strands are a fixed not through any sort of ionic or covalent linkage, those are strong bonds, we're going to use hydrogen bonds to take the two strands to put them together. When adenine and thymine form that hydrogen bond, notice that there are two hydrogen bonds that are formed. <coughs> so across the molecule, two hydrogen bonds. G and C, three hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds are what affix the strands to be held in close contact. Now, just thinking about all of this, what do we know about hydrogen bonds is, uh, as far as adding heat? If we add heat, can we do anything to the hydrogen bonds? Yeah, we disrupt them. So if I had to measure the amount of heat required to separate an adenine from a thiamine in the, across the hydrogen bonds and winding them in the uh, cytosine, which do you think takes more heat? Why? Because there are more hydrogen bonds. I got three, just, just in quantity, there are three. Um, and, and actually, we can heat up DNA, and we can cause the DNA to separate into single strands. And it becomes a really powerful tool when you get into biotechnology and biotechniques. Now, this is to hold the two strands together. But you'll remember that it has that helical structure, 
And it basically makes one complete turn, this is about every 10 base pairs. In order to hold that structure, one, we need to have only three rings across. Notice that there are three rings across um, each at each level of the of the of the ladder. In addition, to hold the rotation, we actually need to have Van der Waals interactions between each rung. So we're holding the, the strands together, but we're also holding the rungs together to form that double helix. And so we also have what would be called intra-strand reactions. So within the individual strand, that's why it's intra and not inter, intra, uh, in, inter, but intra. So the intra-strand forces required Interesting forces required to hold the nucleotides at the proper height from each other is on is the responsibility of Van der Waals interactions. So those Van der Waals forces are going to be what hold the nucleotides close together as they form that double helical structure. <coughs> all right, in the last minute here, I have a final question for you all to consider. And if you've heard the answer from me before on this question, then don't blurt it out. Who discovered DNA? Then we're not. Who discovered DNA? How many of you would say Watson and Crick? Yes, no. How many of you? What's that? There's lots of I actually still run, even in 2015, into articles in the popular media that claim that Watson and Crick discovered DNA. James Watson and Francis Crick only elucidated the double helical structure. DNA was actually discovered 60 years prior to that in the 1860s. Almost, no, I'm sorry, not 60 years, almost 100 years before that in the 1860s by a guy by the name of Friedrich Meischer. Friedrich Meischer is the man who discovered DNA. And it is one of my missions to give credit where credit is due because most people have never heard of this guy. And he's vital in the whole DNA process without his discovering things like genome and sequencing the genome and all the things that we can do with DNA from a molecular, from a molecular research standpoint would have never been possible. He found that there was high nitrogen containing com compounds inside of the pus cells from bandages that they were taking off of uh, injured soldiers. Uh, he lived in, uh, in Europe, uh, Austria. Um, he was contemporaneous with another uh, individual that a lot of you know probably a bit more of, uh, Gregor Mendel. So those two guys were living together. Gregor Mendel said there's a heritability particle that we find inside of the cell. Friedrich Meischer said there is a nitrogen containing molecule inside of the cell that he originally called nucleate. And 50 years later, uh, we began to see through the work of Thomas Hunt Morgan, who was working at Columbia University here in New York, or in New York, in the United States, fruit flies to begin to take the idea of DNA, that nitrogen containing material, to see that there was really a heritability particle and begin the process of linking those two things together. We'll talk more about those discoveries later on this semester. That question may come up on the exam. So remember the name, Friedrich Meischer. Will you come out for a second?
selling